Welcome to another edition of the GM Files. Jim Duquette alongside Bobby Evans. We are pleased to be joined with 11-year uh, major leaguer and catcher now for the Washington Nationals, Alex Avila, is on the line, is with us. Alex, good to see you. Give us a, a sense of how spring training is going uh, here in Washington camp, if you would. It's uh, It's been going great. Camp's been going excellent. Um, I've had uh, uh, no complaints so far how, uh, how camp has been running, even with uh, some of the uh, protocols that, that we're going through. But it's been, it's been great. It's been running really smooth. And uh, it's been a good time. Well, it's great to see, you, Alex. Is it, is it feeling uh, a little more normal to you? I mean, you know, we've obviously been through quite a bit, you know, from the last 12 months. And it is nice to see, you know, what appears to be normalcy uh, for the fans, at least for some fans, being in the ballpark. And uh, just curious as to, you know, the day-to-day -day feeling a little more normal. Yeah, day to day, it's been much more normal than uh, than it was last year. Um, and you know, there, there's some there's some things that you know you have to deal with over the over the course of the day that's a little bit different. But for the most part, it, it's it's uh, it's pretty normal. Aside from you know uh, um, you know stadiums not at full capacity yet, or um, you know just some of the extracurricular stuff that typically you'd be used to in a spring training. Uh, you know, getting opportunities to uh, go to lunch and dinner with, uh, with the fellas, but, um, you know, that's kind of opened up now a little bit, you know, guys are, you know, starting to, um, at least, uh, with some precaution, you know, hang out a little bit and, and take the time to get to know each other, uh, away from the field. So that's, uh, that's always an important part. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite parts about, uh, spring training and, and getting on a new team. No question. Uh yeah, no, no doubt. I talked to uh, I talked to Max Scherzer the other day. I asked him what it was like to be reunited with you. He had this big <laughs> smile. So I'll ask you the same question: What's it like to get to be back <laughs> catching Max? Uh, well, it's it, it's great. We actually uh, um, I had a, uh, a question, a similar question after the first time I caught him in uh, in spring uh, um, a few days ago, and uh, a lot of a lot of the, the memories that kind of came back after, uh, you know, the first few pitches in the bullpen prior to the game, uh, just the familiar wind up, um, you know, the familiar way that he uh, throws the ball and, and the way it looks out of his hand. Um, you know, I, I'm probably a little more nostalgic than he is, um, you know, but a lot of memories came flushed, uh, you know, running back to me uh, from our Detroit days. And, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun catching him again. I, I've always enjoyed like our interactions and our conversations because, he loves pitching and he dives right into it. And, and I love that whole uh, chess game between the pitcher and the hitter as well. And, and uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. That's awesome. Well, you know, I, I, I is very unique to, to play, you know, with the Detroit Tigers when you're, when your father is the assistant GM and later the general manager. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think in some cases in baseball, you know, some, some families embrace that and sometimes they even try to avoid it because it can be, you know, a conflict. I mean, obviously you had the talent level that, you know, your talent level dictated a lot, you know, for uh, your dad and that made it easier for him. But eventually, you know, you got traded, but before, before the trade, how, how was it, uh, you know, being in the organization, you know, with your dad for such a, you know, in his, his important role and you're coming up through the system. Well, yeah, I mean, like you were saying earlier, you know, some people try to avoid it, some people try to embrace it. I think we kind of did both. Um, and at least early on, I know he tried to avoid it um, when when I got drafted. Um, I, I'm not sure if you guys know the story, but at least the, the way it's been told to me uh, from uh, David Chad, who was the scouting director uh, at the time when I was uh, drafted. Um, yeah, he, he knew that I was on their radar um, you know, and at least, I mean, David Chad had known me forever. Dave Dombrowski had known me forever. I mean, they, they saw me, they watched me grow up. Um, and, uh, as the, uh, as the season wore on and got closer to the draft, um, you know, he noticed that as far as where I was on their board going into the draft and on, on, um, uh, once it got to, you know, my name on their board, as they were, you know, taking names off the board right in that fifth round, um, you know, they, uh, my dad had, had, had uh, kind of implored uh, David not to take me. Uh, he didn't want, you know, to have to go through the nepotism talk. Um, he didn't want me to have to endure that. Uh, and I think, you know, on, on his side, too, 
you know, I, you know, I think it would have been tough for him, um, you know, which I'm sure, you know, at times over the years, it was a little tough. Um, but, you know, as David likes to, uh, to tell a story, he, he basically told us, look out, if we don't take Alex at this point, it'll be the first time ever that we don't take the best player available um, when it's our turn to pick. And uh, I'm not going to do that. And so my dad kind of relented and, and uh, they, they, uh, they, they took me and David likes to take all the credit in the world, which he should. Um, but, uh, and on the flip side too, like right after that, I mean, it was a, it was a kind of a quick ascent for me, uh, to the big leagues. Um, but just to, to give a little insight as far as like my, my dad was never, um, uh, involved in the conversations with me, I get, at least when, uh, Dombrowski and, and Leland were discussing me. And, um, I'll never, a funny story, actually. Um, when, uh, when I was in double A right before I got, uh, called up to the big leagues, um, my dad was making his rounds, um, going through the minor leagues and, and, and watching all the teams play and, and, and the team's top prospects. And he comes into Erie where, where I was in the Eastern league. And, and, um, I was having a great first half. I made the all-star team. Um, I think like the day before he comes in for a weekend series, I had hit like three home runs in a game and I was just having a great season so far. And, uh, after one of the games, uh, he, you know, we go out to dinner and, and, uh, you know, he's like, man, you know, just telling me how proud he is as far as the improvement that I've made behind the plate. Cause I had only been catching for a year at that time. And, uh, and was just kind of giving me that pep talk. Like, you know, I see if you keep improving, you know, maybe in a year or two, you might have an opportunity here. And a week later I was in the big leagues. So <laughs> it, it just showed that, you know, I think Dombrowski and, and probably Leland more so than anything else had, uh, had different plans, especially with, with where the team was at at that time in the middle of a pennant race at that time, the year before they had just traded Pudge uh, to New York. And um, Gerald Laird was the catcher at the time. And, you know, Gerald was really good catcher, but known, not really known for his bat. And my bat was what was going to get me to the big leagues. And I think uh, Jim really wanted me there. And, you know, uh, to, to Jim's credit, he kind of he protected me too, knowing that I'd only been catching for about a year. You know, putting me in there when, with, uh, with guys he knew I could handle. And, um, and I was able to hit for him and, and, and uh, you know, down the stretch and, and made, a, made a nice run in that 2009 season. I mean, those are some great stories. I, I want to take a little step further on the catching part, right? So you make mm -hmm. the transition to catcher, right? Not mm -hmm. everybody likes to go into that position, right? And, and right. so you've done it. You've had a long career doing uh, something that, I mean, it takes a lot of work. There's a grind to it. You had to endure concussion. I, I mean, I remember talking to you about, I don't know, maybe three different times you've had concussions, maybe mm -hmm. more. So what was that? Like, was there, was there any doubt when you first started do, you know, going into that role? I got to believe that there had to have been some question like, oh, man, do I really want to do this? Uh, th there was, there was a, a little, I wouldn't say doubt, but just a little uneasiness, um, you know, because I just wasn't sure. Because when the head coach, I went to Alabama, when the head coach had approached me, about catching I'd been playing third and first for for two years you know my entire childhood I I played in the infield and so going into the year that I was eligible for the draft I'd be making a position change so that was kind of um you know I was a little unsure about that um everyone I mean I was a, I was a really good hitter in college so everyone knew I was going to hit um it was just a matter of where I was going to play and uh but the team, we needed a catcher. We didn't have a catcher. Uh, we had, um, you know, a couple of guys get injured that were supposed to be our catchers, I think. And one of their recruiting recruits was uh, signed out of high school. So I just kind of jumped at it. You know, he, he was like, look, you're going to catch. Well, DH is some. You're going to hit fourth in lineup. And, uh, and I just kind of went in all, all in and kind of challenged myself over the course of that year to, to get better. I think I was able to show that I was able to improve pretty quickly. And I mean, within 11 months of learning how to catch, I was in the big leagues in the middle of a pennant race and uh, it was, it happened really fast. And I mean, o over the course of my career too, you know, the way I was taught to catch then and the way even like now I'm catching now has been a huge adjustment 
Um, and like what I was taught back then is, you know, they don't teach catching like that anymore. So uh, in order to kind of stay in the big leagues, I've had to reinvent myself a little bit behind the plate as well um, because the game has changed so much, even just in this last decade. Now, when you, when you say that, Alex, are you speaking more of how you're calling a game? Or are you speaking of sort of the, 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 you know, the analysis of a, of a catcher in terms of his uh, pitch framing, or is it, is it more uh, just expectations of uh, leadership or what, what's, what's been the most significant part of that change? Well, the, the most significant part I would say has definitely been the, uh, the framing aspect and also the pitch calling um, and, and calling a game uh, that has changed dramatically where, um, you know, my, my first few years, a lot, I mean, even though we had scouting reports and, and, and a lot of the reports that, you know, we relied on the pro scouts, um, we also made a lot of our own assertions, uh, just from, you know, watching the game, you know, watching the video on our own and writing out our own scouting reports. I, I remember countless hours in the video room with guys like Scherzer, Verlander, you know, in those early Detroit days, we would sit there and, you know, watch, you know, 30 to 30 minutes to an hour worth of video of the next team we're going to face and literally just kind of jot down uh, what we're seeing. And, um, and then we kind of take, took that uh, into the game uh, with whatever those guys were featuring that day. And uh, now with the, with the analytics and the information involved, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's completely changed that it's kind of actually, helped in, in some aspects where it's a little bit less uh, kind of grinding work that I would have to do as a catcher. But what mm-hmm. it's allowed me to do is kind of focus on the instinct part of it, which I think, you know, is one thing that, uh, you know, most catchers are have kind of lost a little bit now where they're not given that opportunity to, to kind of use their instincts and, and uh, make a change. Uh, from what they see make, and make that adjustment according to what they see the hitter doing mm-hmm. uh, where that's, that's really how I called the game through the minor leagues in my first few years where you're making adjustments on what your, what pitches you're calling based on what you see the hitter is doing. And um, you know, so I've kind of had, uh, um, I've kind of enjoyed the fact that I've been able to get this information and I could apply it to my experience already uh, and trusting my instincts uh, on the field and what I see as far as hitters making adjustments and kind of match that up mm-hmm. and what I'm seeing from the pitcher in order to make the best decision for that pitch. And, um, you know, I've always, I've always talked to many pitching coaches where, you know, if they're trying to decide between, um, you know, a couple of different pitchers at a camp or something like that, I always tell them, give me the guys that can throw strikes because if he's throwing strikes ra- rather than stuff, I can get them through the innings you want, you want them to based on what we have now, as far as the information. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's, uh, but, and the framing aspect of it too, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's, I mean, something that I've had to at least look at more closely mm-hmm. throughout my career, uh, which I've had, I've had no problem with. I know some, some guys are, uh, you know, maybe, not as apt to, 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 to make an adjustment or, or kind of look at that because the, the data may not be as um, foolproof as people would like, but um, it's, it's just, it, you're, you're trying to help your pitcher and that's the way I look at it. And so I, I just wanted to make sure, you know, I'm doing everything I can to help him. We'll be back to GM files right after this Jim, The big tournaments going teams are playing basketball. Some some teams are winning and some teams are losing and some teams that were supposed to lose have won and some teams that were supposed to win have lost, Jake. I can't believe Iona got robbed like that. UConn. It makes you wonder. But Oral Roberts' story of the tournament so far and that was your old acapella group name. So happy for them. And Jim, if you pick the next Oral Roberts, the next upset, Jim... You don't even need the upset. You bet one dollar, you get the winner. You win a hundred bucks. Who's Oral Roberts playing? Arkansas. Oral Roberts versus bet one dollar in Arkansas to beat Oral Roberts, and you win a hundred dollars. Down with Oral Roberts. You're locking that up. Wow. 
Oral Roberts is not a school you want to root for. And if you're not a college basketball person, UFC is going UFC 260, and they're giving you the same deal if you got the right fighter. So pick a winner, $1, win 100 Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code GM Files when GM you Files. sign up to turn one dollar into one hundred. That's code GM Files one dollar into a hundred only at DraftKings Sportsbook. You must be twenty-one or older in New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com/sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call one eight hundred Gambler or in Indiana. 1-800-9 with it. With it. Back to it. Mm-hmm. You know, Alex, it, you, there's so much uh, on that answer that I want to ask you about, but I'll, I'll try to I'll try to find that was that was a really good answer. The, but I wanted um, your preparation with Verlander and Scherzer, right? So you've caught some great pitchers, right? Those two guys. I remember Price was with you, Porcello, mm-hmm. those teams that got to the World Series, uh, winning the ALCS. Is there is there something about those guys? They're obviously they're different style pitchers, but is there something about them that it maybe from an intangible standpoint that they all possess or most of them possess the really good ones that you that you've seen? Yeah, I think uh, just that innate drive to be the best. Um, I think you know guys like like Justin, Max, you know the the. I mean, I, like you said, I've, I've been very fortunate to catch some great pitchers. I was able to catch Chris uh, Sale for a year in Chicago with the White Sox. Um, you know, I've been able to catch Lester and Jake Arrieta, I mean, with the Cubs. I mean, and, and you know, Grinky with the Diamondbacks. All those guys, like there's a certain – there's a certain level of um, – I want to make sure I put this right away. Kind of a, a selfishness that drives them to be the best. That it's almost like, you know, they want to make sure that they're in that conversation for Cy Young every year. They want they want to be at that top, um, in that top echelon of, of pitchers every single year. Um, and I mean that that drive is something that's always a little bit different than most pitchers. I mean most pitchers. Um, they have the ability, but lack the confidence. Um, those guys do not lack confidence whatsoever. Now, that obviously comes with success, um, you know. But you'll gain that success through that through that hard work. If you have a little bit of ability, if you have that kind of ability, you put the work in, um, and, and you're willing to listen and make adjustments, you will be successful. Um, and and those guys have been able to do that. And, and that's, that's the, that's what I've noticed uh, when I'm catching, you know, players and, and, and pitchers of that caliber. You know, there's a, there's only so many spots on an all-star team and, you know, you're young in your career and, and in 2011, you, you make the all-star team. What, what did that mean to you? And, and what was that like, you know, being in your first all-star game? Uh, that was incredible. Um, I mean, to be completely honest with you, I, you know, I'd never, uh, like I, I never aspired to, to do that, playing an all-star game or anything like that. My, my dreams were always like, I wanted to, you know, play in the big leagues and I wanted to win a world series. Like I didn't, you know, what happened personally, like it wasn't a big factor for me. And, but as that year went on, um, you know, I was having a really good season, uh, obviously. And, and, as as it got closer to that uh, that game, like I, I I felt myself like wanting it more and more, and um, you know, so I I was I was doing everything I could to try to to try to make that team at least from a from an offensive standpoint and a defensive standpoint. Uh, one of the coolest things about that that year though was how the city of Detroit kind of rallied around. Uh, around me to, to help me get into that all-star game and, and eventually be the starter for that game. Uh, Cause I, I believe it was between me and Russell Martin um, right. going into, yep. going into that game. He was having a great season too for the Yankees. And um, you know, obviously when you're competing with a market like New York, it, it, it's kind of tough um, when it comes to fan voting. So um, what the city of Detroit, uh, did as far as kind of rallying behind me to get me in there was was pretty incredible and something that 
that always stick with me. Was that your best uh, individual moment maybe at the major leagues or is there some other one that stands out? Um, yeah, no, I would say, I mean, that year, obviously, I mean, people look at that year that for me, that was, I was an all-star silver slugger and I might have even garnered some MVP votes that year. That was like, um, you know, for me, that, that was the best, best year of my career. I've had some good years, but obviously that, that one stands out. Um, and, uh, that, that was, um, that was a tremendous season. And, and, uh, I mean, I've had some, some nice individual games, uh, right. but just that season on a whole was great. How about your team? What your best team moment? One of those world, you know, the World Series team. Was there another one that maybe stood out more? I don't know. I'm curious on that. Well, I mean, there were there were some really good team moments. Um, oh man, I would have to say the, the pro, that 2012 team, and um, like when I look back at the teams in Detroit. Um, that 12 team, I mean, we had a good team in 2011 as well. I think we won 95 games, but, uh, that 12 team and the 13 team, um, I thought were two of the best teams. And then, you know, people always ask me about the 14 team because we had four Cy Young award winners in the rotation, but, um, you know, those two years, uh, were pretty incredible. And, and the way we kind of went through the playoffs, uh, in both years, um, you know, for me was like, you know, th those, those, the guys on those teams is, uh, you know, th th those guys are like lifelong friends. We became families over the course of those years and those playoffs. And, um, you know, th those will be memories that I won't forget. Yeah. Well, 2012 was uh, obviously very special for, for us in San Francisco right. too. So um, yeah, you guys can't cross paths there. Yeah. But yeah, I remember I remember after game four, I'm I'm you know, I'm I'm rushing to the elevator to go down to the clubhouse. And you know, I it's it's a big moment. I mean, it was it was probably it had to be the coldest baseball oh, game yeah. I think I'd ever seen. I I yeah. I you know it's such a big game and I, I I found myself spending most of my time looking through a window in the suite because I I just it was freezing. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I rushed out to the elevator and I and I'm about to get on and I realized that that your dad and Dave Dombrowski are both on that same elevator. And I I, I feel kind of badly getting on an elevator with them because, you know, obviously the series just ended and 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 Dave, you know, sees me and he, you know, in the elevator, puts his arm around me and says, Bobby, congratulations. I mean, first class. I mean, first class. Mm -hmm. And. He's like, but Bobby, I have to tell you, I, I, I didn't, I didn't see you sweeping us. I didn't see you sweeping us. And I don't think we could have, I mean, you guys had the best offense probably in the game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you know, of course, a one run win there, you know, to finish the series, of course, if it hadn't finished that night, you know, storms came in the next day, I think we would have had a pretty good delay, but right. uh, you know, obviously a great team. I mean, that, that game in, in uh, AT&T where Pablo hit three home runs, I remember, yeah. You know, the, you know, you, know you, you certainly, you know, I know that uh, Verlander wasn't expecting it, but, you know, you're behind, you're, you're watching this, you know, behind the plate. I mean, what, what's your perspective on, on Pablo and that night? Well, that was, uh, I mean, that, there was not, I, I, I'm pretty, if I remember correctly, it was a home run to right, a home run to center, a home run to left. And they were on three different pitches. That tells you something right there. Um, and, you know, he was on, he was just on fire and there was, I mean, you could have, you could have tried to walk him and I think he would have still hit one over the fence uh, at that <laughs> point, uh, the way he was swinging the bat. But um, I mean, what, what he did, what he did in that series uh, and, and kind of the shock that, that gave us, um, you know, especially off, off a guy like Justin, um, sure. like you knew, like, you know, with, with the, with, with our other guys coming in from the bullpen, having to face him, there was, uh, there was not much we had an answer, had an answer for when it came to, to Sandoval in that series. Uh, he was, he was pretty much a man on a mission. Right. You know, I'm, I'm curious, you, uh, sure. What? Six, six team major league team with the nationals now, I believe. Um, yeah. Does that sound right to you, the major league? Uh, mm -hmm. And you've had a lot of different managers during that, but is there, is it, is, 
does Jim Leland stand out as the one for you that had the most impact or is there somebody else? Yeah, no, J Jim does. I mean, uh, the, the managers that I've played for in my career, I've, I've, I've had great relationship with, so I've, I've, uh, I've enjoyed playing for, for all of them. Um, but Jim is, uh, is kind of the top of that list for me. I mean, he's, he's the one that brought me to the big leagues and, um, you know, people ask me about him all the time. Uh, what was it like playing for him? And, you know, I, I tell people, it's like, well, you think it's like about, you know, talking to Jim Leland and hanging out with Jim Leland, that it's exactly what it is. Like you're you know, the, the, the persona that, that, that has, has been created of Jim Leland is, is very, very true and, and correct. He's extremely honest. Um, he's a lot of fun can be, you know, uh, hilarious and at the same time breaking the song if he wants to but at the same time you know he he can be he can be tough uh when he needs to and all while smoking a cigarette so um and i tell i tell people all the time when i when i they ask me questions about jim is is i would want run through a wall for that man yeah so, so alex you got a big season ahead of you you got you know um you know a lot of playing days ahead but when, when you when you think about even for a minute after after your playing career what what comes to mind do you think about managing do you think about front office do you, do you think about baseball as being you know a next step in the game well i'm i'm definitely going to stay in the game in some capacity uh i love it way too much it's i mean as you guys know it's been in my family you know since my grandfather and um you know i, I would i mean i remember as a as a kid going with my dad to the ballpark um where, when it was when whether it was with the, when it was with the Florida Marlins or in Detroit. Um, and I always felt like to a certain extent, I could, uh, I can be an assistant GM or GM watching him do his job every day. Obviously it's very different than, you know, when you actually have to make those decisions, but um, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure yet if I want to do something that keeps me on the field, um, you know, or, or something that, that either puts me in the front office or uh, in the media, but, um, I will definitely be still involved in baseball it's in some way. Uh, I just enjoy it way too much. Um, and the one thing that I have uh, enjoyed doing as, as I've gotten in, into my later part of my career is, um, is working with younger players. Um, I've had a, a lot of fun doing that. Uh, I feel like I can, you know, I, I can speak uh, a language like most guys understand uh, when it comes to you know, helping guys figure out, um, you know, kind of their roles and, and how, how to get better. So uh, I've enjoyed that, so which kind of helped, you know, I, I think about well, maybe managing uh, and, and coaching, but um, I've always thought whenever, uh, whenever that, that bridge comes, I'll, uh, I'll have a, a decision to make. So we'll see. And you've, you've given us some good evaluation, so you'd be good in the front office, too. So you have some good, really <laughs> cool choices. Uh, all right, let me ask you one more. That you, you, you love being around young players. I mean, you've been around a lot of young players now, and there's right. some really talented ones. Is there, is there like, I, for me, watch, you know, like I would pay – I don't – I still get in for, you know, for, for free to, to games. But if I were to pay money, Fernando Tatis <laughs> would be one of the guys for me now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, Bobby, his answer might be different. What What's your answer? If you're paying, or even if you're not, just watching, Who do you, is there a young player that you just love to watch right now? Well, I mean, it, I'm, I'm, pro, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on my current team now. Uh, I mean, everyone talks about Soto, uh, rightfully so, because what he's done in a short period of time is, is nothing short of incredible. Um, but I'm really excited to watch Trey Turner play every day. Um, you know, I remember when he kind of first broke in and, you know, there was a lot of hype around him, uh, as well, um, just with his athleticism, but, um, I've noticed that in this spring, um, getting to, you know, watch him on a daily basis. Uh, so as, as much fun as I'm going to have watching Juan Soto hit, I'm really excited to watch Trey Turner play, um, on both sides of the ball every single day. That's great. Hey, I, I want to. I mean, you mentioned your grandfather. How much? Uh, I'm not sure how much time you had with him. He was. In, was he based in in Los Angeles during his time with the Dodgers? And you guys are growing up in Florida. Or what, what was your? Mm -hmm. I don't know how much my, time you had with him, but. Right. So my grandfather actually he didn't spend a, a whole lot of time in Los Angeles. He uh, he would be over there a few times a year, uh, but the majority of his time was spent in the Dominican. 
um, running uh, running the Dodgers camp there, and then and then he spent time obviously in LA and and um, um, over the course of his years there. But uh, the majority of his time was was in the Dominican, and we I actually I mean that's that's where a lot of my um, uh, you know uh, baseball I guess acumen came from was 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 playing uh, in the Dominican. That's kind of where I learned how to play. Uh, brother and and my cousin would go down to the Dominican with him every summer, um, all the way up to, until I got to high school. And uh, so, and my dad was you know doing a lot of scouting down there as well. Obviously, over the course of the summer, and uh, so we'd spend a good you know month and a half um, you know in the Dominican uh, at the camp there uh, um, at Campos Las Palmas and. Uh, I would I would wake up every morning with my grandfather at 5 a.m. We'd go over uh, to the camp. I'd you know go with him when he made his rounds, and then I was just um, I was just like another player as a kid. I would I would go in. I'd have breakfast with the players uh, early in the morning. We'd have they'd have their workouts, just kind of like how a spring training is run. They'd have a you know their workouts in the morning. Um, you know, at the end of their workouts, they would have lunch, and then you know guys would get ready for a one o'clock game, mm-hmm. and so every morning I would work out with the players and then I'd sit and watch, watch, uh, watch the game every day. And, you know, that was kind of like my summer as a, as a kid uh, until I got to about high school. And, and uh, so that was, uh, that, those experiences are something that, that I'll take with me for forever. It, it, I mean, the guys that came through with your grandfather, uh, just, <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? I mean, Pedro yeah. and Ramon Martinez and Montesi. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many of them. I can't even name them all. It's, it's, it's crazy. He, he's had an unbelievable career, uh, just like yeah, your dad, just like you. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's had, uh, he's, he's got a, quite a few uh, major leaguers on his resume there. Yeah. It's, it's pretty impressive. Alex, listen, we appreciate it. We could talk all day on this. This has been a lot of fun. We really appreciate the time. Uh, good luck for there in Washington. I'm sure we'll hopefully we'll get a chance to catch up with you in person once things loosen up a little bit. Hopefully, but, uh, yeah. Appreciate you giving us some time today. Yeah. All right, guys. Good Thanks luck, for having Alex. me. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Alex Avila.